Hello everyone, it's Nerdgasm. Today's comic review is going to be on the 1988 Batman story, The Cult. I am finally getting to this one after so many requests for it over the years. It was written by Jim Starlin, with art by the late Bernie Wrightson. Wrightson was known for his amazing horror illustrations, having co-created Swamp Thing, and had even done an adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which you should go out of your way to check out sometime. The art in it is incredible. Wrightson's style comes to good use in the cult, and meshes with the tone of the story perfectly. There are a lot of grisly visuals in it that stick with you, embed themselves within the deepest and darkest recesses of your mind. The Cult is a storyline that spans four issues or chapters, entitled Ordeal, Capture, Escape, and Combat. It's set ten years into Bruce Wayne's crime-fighting career as Batman, and is a vital step of his journey, depicting his first real defeat against a supervillain, the debuting Deacon Blackfire, a power-hungry cult leader who operates out of Gotham sewers. We get to see what this kind of a loss does to the Dark Knight, how it changes him, affects his motivations and confidence moving forward, and whether or not his lifelong crusade, the promise he made to his parents, is able to endure. The cult begins with a nightmare Batman is having, depicting him killing his arch-nemesis the Joker with an axe. Each strike feels more gratifying than the last, and it's something he thinks he should have done years ago. Batman comes to his senses, realizing it's just a dream, and may even consider it to be an omen, though he's never been the superstitious type. The Dark Knight awakens to find himself chained up in the sewers beneath Gotham City. He's being held a prisoner by several gaunt-looking people, members of a cult led by the mysterious Deacon Blackfire. They tell exalted stories about their leader, their messiah, who claims to be a centuries-old mythical shaman sent by God to eliminate evil. Blackfire's followers, he is named Underworlders, are members of Gotham's homeless population, turned into vigilante murderers that kill any lawbreakers and sinners within the city. Batman had been investigating the disappearance of Gotham's homeless and had found a trail of bloody handprints and footprints leading into a sewer grate. After stopping a mugging, Batman would be shot from behind by the man he thought he was saving and was dragged into the sewers to meet Blackfire. Deacon Blackfire is like Batman in a lot of ways. He fights for the poor and unfortunate, wants to protect those that are good, and is willing to punish those that are evil. But unlike Batman, he chooses to kill, which he views as execution and not murder. He labels the justice system as being broken and illiberal, trying and failing to rehabilitate the criminals, the animals of society. I love how this story juxtaposes the characters of Batman and Deacon Blackfire, emphasizing the similarities, strengths, and weaknesses of both men's ideologies. Of course, Blackfire and his beliefs are far more antagonistic. Fueled by his religion, he should, for all intents and purposes, be more righteous than Batman. But like all things, power and influence corrupts. The deacon has become a monstrous hypocrite, unenlightened. He and his followers target sinners of all kinds, big and small, and many innocent people become caught in the crossfire. He's oblivious to the fact that his actions have made him just as wicked as the evil he claims to be against. Like a lot of these religious nuts, he believes himself to be free of sin without realizing the actuality that everybody sins, either by choice or by proxy. No one on this planet is completely innocent. Some rules are meant to be broken for society to function, and all the decisions we make can influence the wicked decisions of others. Easiest example, the company that writes your paycheck. Maybe the CEO uses the money you help them make to do drugs, gamble, or commit adultery. You don't know, you'd never know. Anywho, over the course of several days, Blackfire and his cultists use torture and manipulation to slowly break down Batman and convert him to their cause. 
Whenever he mocks them and their beliefs, they burn his flesh with a hot poker stick, and his screams fill the tunnels beneath Gotham City. Batman is fed a strange green liquid that only has enough nutritional value to sustain him and nothing more. It tastes disgusting, and Batman believes it may be laced with something, but his intense hunger pains overpower those thoughts. Many of the Underworlders share their own personal stories of redemption with Batman to sway him to their side, one of the more notable being from a woman named Sally, who used to be a prostitute that was horrifically mutilated by her pimp. Joining up with Blackfire allowed her to get even with him. Eventually, Batman is confronted by Blackfire again, and is injected with a hallucinogen inside of his ring. As he trips balls, he is taken to a room to stand before a large totem pole, the symbol of Blackfire's power from the stories Batman had heard about. Due to all of the torture and manipulation, as well as the drugs currently in his system, the Dark Knight finally caves in and accepts Blackfire's truth. He finally believes. Batman continues to hallucinate, and this time finds himself battling Two-Face. The fight ends when Batman kills Dent with a machine gun, and when he goes to inspect the body, Two-Face suddenly transforms into Commissioner Gordon, symbolizing that Batman is not only putting an end to his enemies, but putting an end to law and order. The Dark Knight awakens from his hallucination, and comes to realize he has unwillingly been taking part in an underworld raid of a Mafia Don's house. Death is all around him. Batman has literal blood on his hands. After returning to the sewers with the rest of the cult members, the Dark Knight begins questioning things, trying to remember what had happened, the truth he had been shown by Blackfire. Though the effects of the drugs are beginning to weaken, his mind is still fuzzy, and the hallucinations are still present. One of Blackfire's followers, a man nicknamed Ratface, approaches Batman and asks for his assistance in eliminating a pimp that used to hang out in his old neighborhood. They go back up to the surface to find him, and Batman is having difficulty separating his hallucinations from reality. After witnessing Ratface stab the man, Batman becomes confused, knowing something about all of this is terribly wrong. A police officer arrives, and Ratface goes to attack him, which causes Batman to spring into action and knock him out. When the officer tries to help Batman, still disoriented, he gets knocked out as well. Batman's mind and spirit are in shambles. He wakes up in Gotham Park and feels like his entire body is falling apart. I love the visuals here, showing Batman melting as if he were made of wax. Starving, Batman scares away a couple enjoying a peaceful picnic and steals their food like an animal, which is an insane image. Once his head becomes clearer, he decides to return to the sewers to confront the deacon, but his will has definitely been shaken from his ordeal, and he's kind of afraid to do so. The Batman appears scared. He breaks into Blackfire's inner sanctum to find it filled to the brim with luxury items, because of course it is. When he exits, he gets knocked out from behind by an underworlder, and is taken to Blackfire. Ratface had been captured by the GCPD, and he tells them everything about Blackfire's operation. The real motives behind his holy crusade are politically charged. His goal is to undermine the city's government, portray himself as a hero to the people, and take over Gotham. On television, we see that some citizens have actually sided with Blackfire. They believe the city would be safer with him in charge of it, and that as long as he is killing criminals, what harm could there be? Kids, we call these kinds of people mindless sheep. The mayor of Gotham, as well as the entire city council, are swiftly assassinated by the Underworlders, who make the deaths look like mob hits to further discredit the city's government and the GCPD. The only authority figure left in the city is Commissioner Gordon, who dispels any rumors that Batman has joined up with Blackfire's cult. 
In the sewers, Batman is ordered to be taken to the bathing room to have his throat slit and be drained of blood so that Blackfire can nourish himself with it. What in the holy mother of fuck does that mean? The long walk gives Batman enough time to recover from the hit he had taken to the head earlier, and he escapes his captors by jumping into the water. The underworlders open fire into it with their guns, and Batman is presumed dead. Since the Dark Knight had been missing for a while, Jason Todd, Robin, had met with Commissioner Gordon and infiltrated the sewers to see if he could find him. Robin dives into the water after Batman and is led into a dark tunnel. The smell inside is foul and he can't see a thing. The surface he is walking on feels squishy and he compares it to garbage. Robin calls out to Batman repeatedly and gets a faint response. Batman declares this his punishment for not keeping the faith, for doubting Blackfire. Robin manages to locate his flashlight and shines it into the tunnel to find bodies, hundreds of them, piled up as Batman on the brink of insanity welcomes him to hell. The dynamic duo have stumbled upon a mass grave of Deacon Blackfire's victims beneath Gotham, those he deemed sinners. Blackfire's influence continues to grow as more homeless people from other parts of the country flock to Gotham to join his crusade. The Underworlders would kill a news anchor and hijack the network. Deacon Blackfire sends a message across Gotham. He tells them that the criminal elements are taking over and that he must be given command of the city and its government to maintain order. He promises to protect them under his fascist dictatorship. Yeah, right. After contacting the state governor, Commissioner Gordon declares martial law in Gotham and is shot in an assassination attempt while giving a speech. The governor then calls in the National Guard, who impose a curfew on the city. Soldiers enter the sewers to battle the deacon's forces, but are no match for them when their lights and technology are taken out. The Underworlders even have snipers shooting at troops on the streets from within sewer grates. The National Guard suffers extreme losses with almost all of them eliminated, and the governor orders that Gotham City be evacuated. Only half of the total population leaves though, as the other half have sided with Blackfire and want him as their leader. The remaining police and National Guard set up base outside of Gotham to prevent anyone from going in or out. The city has been overrun, successfully taken over by Blackfire and his underworld empire. Batman is still losing touch with reality due to the withdrawal he has been suffering from Blackfire's drugs. He feels he is solely responsible for all of the deaths of Gotham citizens at the hands of the Deacon, that he could have prevented each and every one of them. The sadness and feeling of failure overwhelms him. Robin slaps him out of it which is funny, probably as a way for getting him back for all of the slaps he had received over the years. You've seen the meme, you know what I'm talking about. Batman and Robin make their way through the tunnels and come across Blackfire's totem, which is much smaller than it had appeared in Batman's hallucination, cementing the fact that Blackfire is a liar, a con artist who's fluffing up his myth. They also come across another chamber, a hidden one, where Blackfire is bathing in the blood of his victims, which supposedly extends his lifespan and makes him pretty jacked too, Christ. This is honestly disgusting. Imagine the blood of multiple people filling your pores, any cuts you might have, getting in your eyes, your other areas, all those mixing blood types. If it reached your bloodstream, it would be fatal. Anyways, Robin's foot hits what appears to be a tin can or possibly an exposed pipe and makes a sound, blowing their cover. The caped crusaders are chased through the tunnels by the underworlders and are forced to fight them. Robin does most of the work because Batman is still hesitant. His confidence has been shot to pieces. But in this instance, the aggressive and hot-headed nature of Jason Todd works in their favor. He thrives on the action and the violence, and it makes up for Batman's current shortcomings due to Blackfire's drugs.
That is, until the horde of mindless zombies, that's basically what they are at this point, let's not deny it, get the better of Jason. Robin calls out for Batman to help him, which thankfully breaks through. Batman proceeds to beat the absolute fucking shit out of them, more brutal than usual, which surprises Robin, but I think it's due to his desperation. That's why he's fighting like this. He's uncomfortable with everything going on and wants it over with as fast as possible. That, and he's like a caged animal that has just been released. The two manage to reach the surface and contact Alfred, who picks them up. Bruce tells Jason and Alfred that they are leaving Gotham and never coming back. The city is lost, Blackfire has won, and the Batman has failed. They do leave Gotham, but only for a week, as Bruce begins having nightmares where he is pursued and attacked by zombified versions of his parents, who tell him how ashamed they are of him for abandoning his city. After a quick pep talk from Alfred and a reminder of why he chose to be Batman in the first place, Bruce feels ready to take his city back from Blackfire and his underworlders. Batman and Robin adjust their arsenal and choose to arm themselves with guns loaded with tranquilizers, darts, and gas and such. I know a lot of you out there, especially newer and naive Batman fans, are going to be upset about this because he doesn't use guns, ever. But keep in mind, he has in the past, and under the right circumstances, it shouldn't bother you all that much. The biggest takeaway of the character is whether or not he is killing someone, and in this case, he isn't. The guns aren't filled with bullets. Also, given the situation they find themselves in, there is no logical reason why he and Robin shouldn't be using some form of firearm. They are going up against an army. They are fighting a war. You can't expect them to beat hundreds, if not thousands, of Blackfire's followers with their bare hands and a couple of nifty gadgets. I know this is a comic book, but let's just step back for a second and get real. When the heroes arrive back in Gotham, we see that the Batmobile has been turned into a giant motherfucking monster truck, badass, armed with missile launchers and machine guns. We're told that its weapons are also filled with tranquilizers, but that I'm not buying as much. With the Batmobile, Batman and Robin are able to gun down, I mean incapacitate, half of the Underworlder army on their way to Gotham Square. They also come across a site very reminiscent of Nazi Germany, with bodies hung from street lamps. The Gothamites that had decided to remain in the city in support of Blackfire had been rounded up and put to work in enslavement camps, or were victims of mass executions. See? Religious cults and fascist governments only see you as a piece of meat, a simple pawn, something to be used up and then tossed away. When the Caped Crusaders reach Gotham Square, they are ambushed by Blackfire's cultists, who start ripping the Batmobile apart with their bare hands. Thankfully, Batman and Robin are able to escape into the sewers through an escape hatch. We learn that Deacon Blackfire wants to die. He wants a glorious death that will reinforce his religious principles and rally his followers to continue his cause long after he is gone. He orders the Underworlders to not harm Batman on his way to the arena. He wants to face him at full strength. Batman finally comes face to face with Blackfire for the first time since he had been broken by him. The Deacon commands Batman to kill him in front of his followers, but the Dark Knight doesn't give him the satisfaction. Instead, he beats him harder than he has anyone else since donning the cowl. Batman isn't aiming to knock Blackfire unconscious, but wants to make him feel pain, wants to break him like he did him. All of the cultists watch on as their messiah bleeds and begs for mercy like a human being, not like a god. Defeated, Blackfire orders his underworlders to kill Batman, but sensing his fear, they turn on him instead, angry that he had manipulated them. No fucking shit. 
Orders returned to Gotham City. The citizens that had evacuated returned to their homes, who I guess what would be left of them, and members of the Underworld Empire go back to wherever they had come from before. The comic doesn't address whether or not any of these people are prosecuted for their crimes, though. I get that they were being manipulated and were under the influence of Deacon's hypnotic drug or drugs, but there had to have been a few of them that were missing doses, and actually acting out of their own accord. Hunger had something to do with the potency of the drugs. If you ate too much, they would lose their effectiveness, which is why Deacon would feed his minions the bare minimum to keep them alive and nothing more. I feel like a couple of these followers may have been more sober than others, though, that found a pleasure in all the violence, did it just because they wanted to, but oh well. The story ends with Batman returning to the sewers and burning down a Blackfire's wooden totem, leaving nothing to chance or superstition. A lot of comparisons can be made between the events of the cult as well as 1993's Nightfall. Both stories have Batman utterly destroyed by the central antagonist. Nightfall is much slower paced, it's a much longer story, and while it does have Bane psychologically and emotionally break Batman down, it does put a far greater emphasis on the physical, with Batman's spine being broken. With the cult, I think it does a much better job with the mental aspect of it. Batman's spirit is shattered like glass. His morality becomes compromised, corrupted. For the first time since becoming Batman, Bruce Wayne's mind, his entire outlook, has been lost at sea, and he begins second-guessing himself and his abilities, not entirely comfortable going back into the sewers to face Blackfire again, and hesitating when fighting the Underworld with Robin. Another of Batman's storylines I compare the cult to is of course Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, and how could you not? The giant monster truck Batmobile gives off similar vibes to the tank version he used in that story, both awesome. Him and Robin fighting an army to take back Gotham, the Underworlders here, and the mutants in The Dark Knight Returns. And you could even focus on the use of guns in both stories, as a means to even the odds as well. Deacon Blackfire is a great Batman villain very easy to despise with every fiber of your being. While he lives like a king, his followers live like rats in a sewer, walking around and sleeping amongst the filth. The only way he is able to convert others to believe his bullshit is by targeting the weak-minded and most desperate within society the easiest to manipulate, the most vocal, and the only ones who will waste their time listening to his rhetoric. Those that don't believe in him and his beliefs are eliminated, killed, and thrown into a giant mass grave beneath the city. Something else I really hate is when his followers attack people. They do so from behind with weapons, like gutless cowards. Blackfire views himself as a messenger of God, higher up on that totem pole compared to everyone else, but in actuality, he is as low as they come in regards to morals, closer to Satan than he is to God. I want to thank you all for watching my review of Batman the Cult. Feel free to share your thoughts and opinions on the storyline as well as the Deacon Blackfire character himself down in the comment section below. The Cult is a very dark, disturbing, and violent Batman story which some people don't always enjoy, finding them to be a bit too excessive at times, but here it fits the subject matter perfectly in my opinion. Its discussions regarding Batman's morality, how it challenges it, are interesting and make it one of the more memorable and significant stories in the Dark Knight's mythology. If you enjoyed the video and would like to see more like it, make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that bell icon for notifications, and become a producer over on Patreon.com if you can. I will see each and every one of you in the next one. Take care, stay safe, and always stay nerdy.